Hi, my name is Catherine Boissonneau. I'm a full-time clinician working in inpatient rehab, and this poster is about strategies we used at the UF Health Rehab Hospital to facilitate gait recovery in a patient who had a stroke immediately following his LVAD implantation. A little bit of background first. LVADs, or left ventricular assist devices, are typically implanted in individuals with advanced heart failure who are no longer responsive to medical management. This can be done as a temporary measure for individuals waiting on a heart transplant, called a bridge to transplant, or as a permanent measure to reduce symptoms for those where transplant is not possible, called a destination therapy. LVADs are mechanical battery-operated pumps surgically implanted into the chest that provide circulatory support using a continuous flow system. The LVAD removes blood from a failing left ventricle and returns it to the ascending aorta, which then goes to the rest of the body. Surgical implantation of the device is performed via either a minimally invasive thoracotomy or median sternotomy approach, the latter of which typically restricts upper extremity function for six to 12 weeks. The LVAD pump is connected to a controller outside of the body via the drive line, which typically emerges from the patient's upper abdomen, shown here in the image in the lower left. The controller is connected to either wall power or batteries, all of which is carried about the patient's trunk via a vest or crossbody bag. When thinking strictly about post-LVAD rehab, we can expect the patient to be deconditioned due to the advanced heart failure, but also from the surgery, mechanical ventilation, bed rest, et cetera, and potentially have sternal precautions following surgery if a median sternotomy was performed. Further, we now need to ensure that the external components of the LVAD, the driveline, controller, and batteries, are not disturbed during activity. One final point I'll highlight is that the LVAD pump provides continuous blood flow, meaning there won't necessarily be a discernible heartbeat or typical blood pressure to monitor during activity. Exercise intensity and tolerance must therefore be monitored by Doppler-guided mean arterial pressure or MAP, rate of perceived exertion, RPE scales, and pump parameter changes seen on the controller. So post-LVAD rehab, complicated but approachable. Now, as was the case with the patient described here, we consider how the rehab complexity deepens when working with someone who's had an acute stroke on top of a new LVAD. The incidence of post-surgical stroke within this population is 12 to 35%. Physical therapy practice guidelines for locomotor recovery post-stroke support the use of high-intensity gait training. However, emerging evidence for exercise parameters post-LVAD recommended initiating training at low intensities with gradual increase to high intensities as tolerated. There is virtually no published data that recommends training parameters or treatment strategies for patients who are both acutely post-LVAD and post-stroke. So keeping this in the back of our minds, let's get into the case. The patient described here is a 73-year-old male with left-sided heart failure and a 10 to 15% ejection fraction who was admitted to the acute care hospital for shortness of breath. On admission, he was found to be in cardiogenic shock and had atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Given his medical history, he and his medical team decided on a HeartMate 3 LVAD placement, which was performed on hospital day four. Unfortunately, on the day after surgery, he sustained a posterior right putamen and internal capsule CVA and experienced residual left hemiplegia. Once medically stable, he was transferred to the UF Health Rehab Hospital in Gainesville, Florida on post-op day 13, where he received PT, OT, and speech. This, this patient's goal was to return to walking independently. And so PT treatment primarily emphasized gait training with external support provided by staff and body weight support. Exercise intensity and tolerance was monitored via RPE and MAP. At baseline, this individual had limited activity tolerance due to his heart condition, but he was ambulatory without a device and independent with his ADLs. On admission to the rehab hospital, he demonstrated significant functional impairment, requiring a two-person assist for transfers and a three-person assist for short distance gait, one person on either side of him with a third person for a close wheelchair follow. He also had sternal precautions following his LVAD surgery, which limited our ability to use assistive devices. 
As you might expect, hospital staffing doesn't typically allow for a three-person assist training session, and the level of assist needed could put our staff at risk for injury. So we began to explore bodyweight support options that would preserve the integrity of the driveline newly protruding from the patient's abdomen. The typical body weight support harness we used in the clinic secures with straps at the thighs or groin, as well as at the abdomen, increasing the risk of shearing or pulling of the driveline. Another style of harness called ambulation shorts, as seen pictured in the lower right, provides support primarily through the upper legs and lower hips, allowing us to keep the upper abdomen free and clear. We stabilized the driveline with an abdominal binder and secured the controller and batteries to the patient beneath the harness. The ambulation shorts connect uh, to a lift via a four-point hook and loop attachment system. At our hospital, we used an overhead lift connected to a ceiling track, but you could connect it to something like a Hoyer lift if it accommodates your patient's height. Once we had an established system and ensured patient tolerance to the setup, we gradually progressed gate training intensity using the RPE scale and monitoring MAP pre and post training. This patient received a total of 30 PT sessions, 22 of which emphasize gait training. As you can see in the center table, his quality indicators, one of the primary outcome measures used in this setting, progressed from a total assist walking 22 feet to a contact guard assist walking over 150 feet with a four-wheeled walker. His transfers also progressed to contact guard assist by discharge. So a note on safety. There were no adverse events related to gait training sessions during his 24-day stay with us. We were in close communication with his primary rehab physician throughout and established MAP cutoffs for initiating and discontinuing training prior to the actual training. We initially monitored exercise tolerance by measuring MAP pre, mid, and post activity, as well as educating our patient on adverse signs and symptoms to self-monitor for. Then we progressed to monitoring pre and post, as well as relying on the patient to notify us of any adverse changes. In addition, the patient's surgical incisions were inspected pre and post session. So the clinical bottom line. Gate training someone post-stroke following LVAD implantation can be really challenging, but it can be done safely. In our case, because we had good patient and family buy-in, physician support, and a solid team approach to maintain patient safety, this patient was able to make excellent progress toward his goal of independent ambulation. My email is listed at the bottom of the poster if there are any additional questions. Thank you.